Um, well, firstly, thank you very much for uh, joining me this evening to talk about sort of the musical um, legacy of the Morden Tower. Um, I'll introduce you all individually in a moment, but just um, for people who aren't aware, uh, the Morden Tower is, um, was originally built in the 13th century and was one of 15 uh, turrets. Um, the Morden Tower itself is uh, a D tower that's found in Newcastle's west walls. From the 16th century, the tower was occupied by the company of plumbers, plasterers and glaziers. Uh, in 1964, Connie Picard acquired the lease to the tower with Tom Picard and began holding the first poetry readings there. And thanks to Connie's continued custodianship and investment in the tower, uh, an experimental music scene uh, formed around shows that started to happen uh, in the early 80s uh, with acts like the New Blockaders and the Tyneside New Music Group. Um, in an email conversation that I've had with Richard Rupiners of New Blockaders, he said of the tower, as soon as we found out uh, about it, we thought it would be an ideal place to put on gigs, not just because it was an unusual venue, but because we knew of its legendary status in poetry circles with the likes of Allen Ginsberg having performed there in the 60s. Uh, so the tower perhaps has quite an illustrious and uh, documented uh, history of poetry readings and performance, uh, but perhaps some of the kind of underground and experimental music um, history is slightly sort of less documented. Um, and sort of alongside sort of Connie's uh, custodianship and um, commitment to the tower, there was a number of key holders and organizers and promoters uh, from the 80s onwards and Luckily, we have some of them with us today. So I'll introduce them now. And first of all, we have Rosie Lewis. And Rosie has been involved in social justice, DIY organizing of arts and music, and feminist activism uh, for over 25 years. At 16, she joined her first punk rock group and kept touring and organizing in various guises for the next three decades gravitating across music collectives and projects that range from DIY Riot Girl to free jazz improvisation. At the heart of everything she does has been a belief in social transformation through collective action and the need for self-defined spaces led by and for marginalized communities. Her work has always been intersectional and underpinned by a black feminist ethos. She currently manages violence against women and girls services for black and minoritized women in the region but works rights and campaigns for women's rights nationally and internationally. Uh, we're also joined by Ben Ponton, who is a founder member of Soviet France, uh, who have played at Morden Tower twice, performing all acoustic sets there uh, that have been unique in the band's gig history. He's also been a gig promoter on and off over the last few decades and involved in organizing events at most venues on Tyneside. And we also have Paul Kelly, who is uh, a promoter of experimental music concerts in the Northeast as one third of A Better Noise, um, who ran between 2006 and 2016. Um, he's also been a key holder and an organizer at Morden Tower. Uh, that was between 2011 and 2013. And he's arranged concerts for the likes of Roger Davis and John Butcher, amongst many, many more. Um, we also have Hassan Galani, who has been part of the Tusk organization since 2011. Uh, he's been putting on gigs in Newcastle since 1989 with the syndicate and as clearing the path for no one. Uh, he was a member of Jazz Finger. Um, and with Jazz Finger, he started putting on gigs at Morden Tower, um, also putting on gigs with Rosie, uh, with Paul and Lee Etherington of Tusk. And he's also, hang on a second, also recorded and performed as Popular Radiation and collaborated with the likes of the New Blockaders and Skullflower. Uh, he's run labels, record shops, and been a radio plugger. And now he's also a label manager of Shellshock Distribution. 
Okay. So first of all, I'm keen to understand sort of personal attachments and relationships that sort of built um, around the sort of organizing in the Borden Tower and how these sort of drove the peripheral music activity and generated scenes in the city. Um, so what initially drew you to being involved with the Borden Tower? And if we start with you, Haz? Um, just looking for a venue uh, around uh, the year 2000 to put a Bible Cathedral Orchestra on. Um, we were a bit sick of upstairs at the Telegraph. Um, they fed up with using the Cumberland Arms. Mm. Uh, um, the Clooney was too big. So um, I just thought um, we'd try, try seeing if we can get in touch with someone to do with Morden Tower. Um, Nev Clay put me in touch with a poet called Ali May who gave me Connie's phone number and uh, phoned Connie up and arranged a meeting and she basically interviewed me and um, I kind of, yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a hard interview. But as, soon as, I mentioned, as soon as I mentioned the Velvet Underground we were in. <laughs> that was about, that's about it there. Uh. And so were you organising those gigs on your own or was there sort of a collective involved? Um, uh, there, was, there was three people in Jazzfinger at the time, me and Ben Jones and Ben Wilkinson, who uh, did it between the three of us. But we, um, before, before we knew it, there were loads of other people were asking to put gigs on and we ended up collaborating with the likes of Rosie and eventually Paul and anybody else. Um, became a key holder, so I had to um, facilitate the venue for other, other people putting gigs on, especially uh, Jumping Hot Club. So I saw an awful lot of Amer Americana gigs, lots of grizzled old fellas with acoustic guitars. And some of them were great, actually. And, uh, you know, most people who came to play the tower were kind of in all the place. Um, mm -hmm. It's history and, and how it looked and its location, you know. Yeah, I think it's sort of important to stress how sort of inaccessible in a lot of ways the modern tower is, like just trying yeah. to trying to get in it, uh, trying sometimes, to find it. Sometimes, sometimes it was really horrible getting in there. Right. There was rats. Mm. Uh, that, that lane was slippy from all the uh, waste of all the um, uh, Chinese restaurants on the other side of the street. Mm. Yeah, it was pretty disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I think I remember you uh, mentioning you know exactly when the rats turned up. Well, the rats arrived when when the bins were moved from Stowell Street to the back line, and then they just went, ah, at last, food, <laughs> warmth, comfort. And so they just bred like rats. Unbelievably. It was amazing. But we also had the only example of a rat actually coming into the upstairs performance space. Mm. Um, and then we all jumped in the air when the rat ran round the room and went back down its hole. Oh, my internet connection is unstable. Mm. Did you get any of that? We got Which the bit. Gig was it? Which gig was it, Paul? That the rat came. Gary Smith. Ah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that, Rosie. Yes, absolutely. Lots of screechy guitars. They probably were breeding noises for rats. But anyway, it was good. The other great event was one that Ben probably remembers. That they were doing their acoustic set. Um and there, were, there was no electricity involved, which is a really good thing because somebody had stolen the electricity cable. Um, so that when we tried to put the lights on, see what the hell we were doing, we couldn't see anything. I mean, I had to get the electricity board out to go, you've got the electric. And um, it was a good night, very quiet, mm. beautiful. Yeah, I remember those shows. They were good. Right. Any 
I'm getting very confused here. Who goes next? <laughs> so, Rosie, were you involved in the tower around sort of the same time? Uh, I mean, I was. I was, I was going, yeah, I mean, I was going along to gigs. I had a much more peripheral role. I think I must have had like a lot of sense compared to these hardened stalwarts. But um, but yeah, I mean, I was going along the gigs. I've known known all of this this crew for a while, and um, I think that I mean it was about two thousand and four, two thousand and five that I put on gigs there, and that was thanks to basically Hass and Ben and Jazz Finger at that point were were the the, the custodians so to speak and mm. then um i actually got introduced to connie and connie doesn't live that far from me um so i had a a good um education should i say from connie as everybody does because she's a, a a phenomenal amazing woman and um and then i mean my 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 agenda was always i was putting like a lot of gigs on that focused on on women um it was particularly underground women performers and the tower was like an ideal place for that um i i'm really big on kind of acoustics and sound as well and i did a lot of sound um i should have said i used to do quite a lot of sound for different people here uh, for different gigs sometimes and um uh, with my pa so uh which was my side hustle because mm -hmm. i was a single parent had very little money and i tell you what that PA, it kept me and my daughter fed for quite a long time, along, alongside my other side hustle, which used to be vegan catering for a lot of the, a lot of the bands that traveled by uh, the Northeast as well, um, as an aside. But yeah, so it was about 2005 um, that I was, I put on, I, I, I put on like a kind of season of, of different gigs, like once a month. So I had like Bridget Hayden and there was Nala and, um, uh, we did a we did the joint one with oh who was it again? Terrible memory. Oh yeah, Hawk and Hacksaw. Do you remember that one as well? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of these gigs they were quite interesting gigs because it seemed like whatever was put on at the Morden, it was just on the cusp of a band becoming really like much bigger, wasn't it? Yeah. And um and often they were like you know really uh, the atmosphere and everything because we haven't really talked about that. Like yes, the lane was disgusting. Yes, it was totally inaccessible. And like, I don't think any of us nowadays would probably put a, on a gig there and sleep at night because a lot of people probably couldn't get up those ridiculous stairs. In fact, a lot of people didn't really get up those stairs because the amount that had to drink or other substances and quite often fell down the stairs as well, if I remember. There used to be a lot of like, like domino toppling because the space is so small. Because we haven't really talked about, I mean, the space is like 50 max, if that, if you stand enough yeah. together. Yeah. But we'd get, sometimes we'd get, what, 100 people turning up for a show? Yeah. Um, so people would be, be listening to it out on the street, wouldn't they? It's particularly on the summer evenings. We'd even have some of the performers actually come out and perform outside of the actual tower space to people there. So anyway, I'll not, I'll not go into that. But yeah, it was about 2005. And it was only because of, of um, other people who were organising there who supported, were supporting the gigs that I was doing. Mm. So, so how was the the tower run at that time? Like, how, you know, what what was the process for making things happen there? So, I just want to say that Connie, Connie's idea of how everything should be run is with anarchy, and she would say that, wouldn't she? She'd be like, "I don't want any organising, I don't want any structure, I just want anarchy." So, from that, I'll let. I'll let the others come in and say how they managed to scrabble things together to make things happen. <laughs> yes. Yes. Anarchy. Yeah. It took a lot of effort, didn't it? It took a lot. I mean, in a way, it had to be a collective. Because for a start, we had to convince Connie that we were able, you know, to try and get the gig on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we had to work out where the keys were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the toilet key. <laughs> yeah, back to the toilet key. Yeah, uh -huh. which was the smallest key. <laughs> I I did actually bring in a major organisational element into this. I attached it to a big piece of wood. So that I, I remember that. <laughs> that was very yes, sensible. It did. Yeah, I can't imagine Ben. What was it like organising back in the day? Was it really early days? Well, I, I, I didn't organise very many gigs there at all, actually, uh, um, in the sort of early days of what became NoFi, which is kind of like the forerunner of Tusk. 
Um, we did one or two gigs there, but my no fi memories are quite a blur because um, a lot of my responsibility was on the uh, sort of like technical production side, and it always seemed like flying by the seat of our, of our pants a lot of the time. So, um, yeah, most of my memories around organizing gigs at the tower are the seat of my pants, <laughs> really. Yeah. Um, but I've got, I've got more kind of like recollections such as they are, they're not, they're not extensive of, of um, being kind of on the other side of the fence and in, in, in either being an audience or, or um, being a performing uh, musician, which uh, with Soviet fans we did twice. I remember, yeah. um, in fact, I dug this out, a bit of show and tell. This, this is- um, Flakes. It's a box of cornflakes. Yes. And it is the cornflakes were great. <laughs> <laughs> it is the um, the very cornflakes, or some of them anyway, that uh, um, we we uh, used in the second uh, acoustic only. Um, we didn't call them acoustic sets. We didn't call them unplugged. We called them no electricity uh, gigs. And um, the second one was part of. Uh, a tour of Newcastle that um, we did with a better noise, yeah. with Paul. Um, and the Morton Tower was one of those gigs, and, and we revisited, revisited it, uh, something that we'd done two or three years earlier in the tower, which was this no electricity uh, gig, and which was um, quite sort of. Uh, um, against everything that we'd ever done before in the sense that we'd, we'd never done acoustic gigs. We, we, we use a lot of um, acoustic instruments or sound sources, but they've always been amplified and they've always been processed. So the idea of having no amplification, no PA system, no electronic processing uh, was really stripping ourselves naked in, in a way that uh, um, we almost regretted uh, when it came to the gig itself. Um, but we managed to um, uh, battle our way through them. And the other as sort of novel aspect about it for us was we are an improvising band in the sense that whenever we play live, we uh, don't know what we're going to do until we've done it. Uh, we walk into the situation and, and literally make it up as we go along. And we realized in, in the planning of, of the two acoustic gigs, two no electricity gigs, that um, uh, we couldn't really get away with that so, so well. So we actually rehearsed and um, uh, planned those gigs. And I've still got, I should have uh, got these out of show and tell as well. I've still, I've still got the post-it notes that uh, uh, we used and we wrote on different types of sound sources and planned them out on, on a big board as to how the, uh, the set would run. Um, so it was kind of like a set list in a way. But the story behind the cornflakes is, is that um, uh, certainly uh, the very last, the last one that we did with Paul, um, and it was, it was very busy. I can't remember how many people were there, but far too many for the size of the space and it was standing room only. And it was pretty much, um, uh, we had everything laid out on the floor when we were playing on the floor. And we pretty much had the front line of the audience in the band almost, it was so close. Which made it even more kind of um, uh, hair raising for us because it was kind of like having a forensic analysis of every little sound that we were making uh, going on right in front of us. Uh, again, something that we hadn't been particularly familiar with, not for many years anyway. I think the last time we did it was in Detroit, uh, where we had the audience that close. And we had the Hells Angels, the, uh, the Detroit Hells Angels standing around us, which was uh, quite disconcerting. So um, uh, having some guys from Washington was, all, uh, was slightly more hair raising than uh, uh, having the D Detroit Hells Angels around us, but there we were. And we started the gig by just standing there doing absolutely nothing. And um, eventually the audience cottoned on <clears throat> uh, that uh, we were sort of actually, in a sense, starting the set, but we weren't doing anything. So 
a gradual and slightly embarrassed silence fell. And our reasoning behind that was that um, uh, we wanted people to tune into the sound around the tower itself, which is, as has kind of been hinted at, it's located in, in a alleyway on the city wall. And the alley is actually the back of Stowell Street, which is Chinatown in Newcastle, uh, which is um, wall-to-wall restaurants. And so around the back of all those restaurants is all the air conditioning um, and heat extraction for, for the restaurant. So not only is it wall-to-wall restaurants, but around the back it's wall-to-wall uh, air con and um, fans and so on. And in sort of preparation for the performance, we'd, we'd noticed this and it, it kind of dawned on us that at every gig, probably ever, um, at uh, a music gig anyway, since the 19, early 80s, that had happened at uh, Modern Tower, there had always been this quiet drone in the background going on all the time. So every gig, that's, and, and every gig that will ever happen um, at the Morden Tower probably has a sort of a drone going on underneath it. So we wanted people to tune into that, which they did very well. And, um, <clears throat> and then we started the set and uh, um, did a couple of things to start with. And then, then the, I think the third thing in the set was uh, uh, we had a oven tray full of cornflakes which Mark um, was going, uh, would walk on and get the crunching sound. So it was kind of like cinema foley kind of stuff. And uh, um, so those are the, these are the complex <laughs> from the second gig, which we always plan to sell on eBay and make stupid amounts of money as a souvenir of the band. But uh, uh, a mixture of can't be arsed and haven't got round to it as, as uh, but now this is on Tusk telly. <laughs> We'll put the cornflakes on eBay. Soviet France cornflakes from the original gig at Morden Tower. Um, and uh, the next, the next thing that happened in the set was, uh, um, I always thought was uh, kind of like totally psychotic. But Mark, the other guy in Soviet France, insisted on doing it. Was he got a large kitchen knife and a, a sharpening steel and started sharpening this knife to get the, the kind of sharpening sound. Um, which uh, meant that the audience slightly took a bit of a step back, but uh, it didn't go any further than that. So happy memories. The f actually, the first gig, there was, was a supreme irony with the first acoustic gig, was, was that the only electrical device that we had running in it was a mini disc recorder, uh, which with mics that we wanted to use to record the set. And uh, it was battery powered. And um, uh, it, it fucked up, the, uh, the recording didn't work. So the one piece of electrical equipment we had at the first acoustic gig chose not to work even itself, which we just decided was a nice irony. So there is no recording, uh, fortunately, because it was probably horrendous when we listened back to it, but a, a great event at the time. Mm. Were you all in attendance at that gig? Yeah, oh, I was there. Well, you were, Paul. Uh, yeah, I do. I was, yeah. I think I put it on, the first one. First one, yeah. First one, yeah. yeah. Right. So what other sort of memorable <laughs> shows? I bet, I bet you're recording that would sound great. I love it. <laughs> well, the second one did get recorded, and it sounds awful. <laughs> 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 we wouldn't play it to anybody. <laughs> Except on eBay, of course. Yeah. No, not even on, not even on, not even on eBay. Yeah. No. no. Cornflakes is one thing, but that recording. Phew. Yeah, that bad. Oof. Well, it's, it's, it's a fine recording, technically, <laughs> but um, it, it definitely shows that it's... Um, and in, in that sense, it's quite interesting that, that we think the recording is so bad as, as, in terms of the content, in terms of the music, it, is that it kind of highlights an aspect of live music. And, uh, and I think this is particularly true of Morden Tower, um, that uh, the events, the occasion, the, the place, and everything that goes with it, the kind of ricketiness, the tendency for the bit of sellotape that is holding up the string, that is tying everything together, 
will come loose and everything will slightly fall apart at the seams, sometimes um, in the middle of a gig, sometimes just before the doors are due to be opened. Um, that all comes together as to create a sense of occasion of an event that is certainly unique in, in Newcastle and the Northeast in, in terms of the place. Um, and is, you know, fairly unique in terms of venues, even similar venues um, that I know about around the world, you know, which tend to be far more organized and far more better appointed in terms of their decor and, and um, technical facility. But uh, um, it was a deliberately anti-capitalist space, wasn't it? It was all yeah. like yeah. that. And I think that we probably, because all of us have been involved in sort of DIY or come from that, that ethos, it's easy to forget that now how how much that was part of kind of you know that sense of organizing and get together was that collectivist way of working and often people would turn up and they'd be like i've got 50 pence will you let us in you'd be like yeah or they'd be like you know i've got a bottle of beer do you want this you know but it, that it, it wasn't about that was it we used to just try 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 and have enough money to pay the people that were play, playing and if we had enough for that, we'd be like over the moon. I mean, Connie never really, t Connie never took a penny. She never profited from it at all. In fact, it was the other way around, wasn't it? Because she ended up having to invest like a lot of her own personal, you know, money. And um, I know she sold like a flat and stuff to keep things going um, at one point. And, but that's what it was about. It was about keeping the spirit of mm. it alive and it, that's you're completely right it was it was absolutely unique and it held that atmosphere i think that's the thing that's really hard to to talk about isn't it the way that it felt was a really it's a really magical place that holds like an amazing sense mm. of history it doesn't matter whether four people turn up for a gig or 100 people turn up for a gig it's just it's i've, I've never been to anything that didn't have like a magical uh, sort of feel and that didn't actually really grip grip my soul or my energy or my creativity or my um kind of mind space in some kind of way it was just one of it's like one of the most inspiring places mm. it's definitely inspiring in many different kinds of ways very <laughs> different ways yeah challenging as well as inspiring. <laughs> threatening sometimes as well yeah. when, when when yeah. did it get a toilet we should we should um, make, you know get oh, the, t this, the story of the toilet is I, I work I did a bit of digging around and investigating and the that kind of cave was what was built into the walls in the probably in the 18th century as little workshops and that when the council decided that they were going to give them a toilet to give the, the tower a toilet they opened it out uh, which is why you have the most solid toilet in the universe. It will it will survive nuclear attack, <laughs> and it really needed to as well. It was vile. <laughs> oh, it was like, utterly vile. Like and there was no water at the end of the night. It was like oh. one false move, and you were on your back in a bucket of piss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and explaining to people that if you want to go to the toilet, you go out of this door, down the stairs, out the gate, turn right, uh, go through this iron door, and the light will come on. <laughs> you go, oh yeah, fine, good, I'll piss, I'll piss on, the, on the rats. Yeah, it was amazing. The toilet, yeah. I think that, it was the council that did that. Well, it was not, that was early 2000s, was it? Or, or later yeah, than that? I think. Yeah. So there, was, so there was 20 years, of, there was 20 years of history of gigs at the tower where there was no toilet. Well, there was no toilet toilet. Official toilet. <laughs> there was the, uh, the alleyway out the back. Yeah. Yeah. But there is also the Rosie's bar at the end of the, um, of the alleyway. Yeah. Um, that, was just, that, was, that was Rosie's <laughs> other job, wasn't it? Running that. Bar. <laughs> it was very bourgeois. Nobody would do that. Nobody would do that. <laughs> that was like sell out. Go to Rosie's bar at the toilet. <laughs> but you, I remember met once. One, one more story. Yeah. Is that I think it was a gig that Hass organised, 
and he put some lights on the stairs <coughs> so that people didn't break their legs as they came up and down and uh, halfway through a rather quiet introverted kind of you know uh, set I don't know I can't remember who was playing somebody grabbed this row of lights and dragged it out down the stairs and out of the door with the most amazing row I've ever heard it was it was brilliant I don't remember that I remember uh, I probably wiped it it's good, good thing to forget really yeah was there um um there, there wasn't always a railing on the stairs, was there? No, that came. That was obviously an improvement. Yeah. So we should explain to people, sort of describe it a bit. Is, yeah, is um, you know, this this medieval city wall with this medieval guard tower on it, and and the kind of steps that you would expect to find in a castle or something like that, going up the the castle wall. Ancient steps, um, obviously designed for when people were. A good 30 centimeters shorter than they are now and um uh, no and and quite steep and quite a few you know it was, it was like you went up to what was the equivalent of the first floor in this in this building and um for a long time there was no railing so it was it was perilous um and you know you, you, you couldn't it was it's only, it's only the width of a person really you can't have somebody going up and somebody coming down so there was always that kind of aspect. There is always that kind of aspect to negotiate it around it all as well. And then when you get inside, whatever, if you've never been there before, whatever preconception that you might get, have from the outside, which is the uh, photograph behind uh, Adam, um, uh, when you get inside, it, 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 it's, it's gone through various stages of uh, decor over the decades. But for a long time, it was pretty much like a living room with... Um, uh, posters of, of beat poets on, on the wall and uh, um, I haven't been there for a few years now so I don't, I don't know if it's been decorated again but it was all kind of like slightly surreal and counterintuitive in, in the, everything about it, every aspect of it um, was, is, if you haven't been there before, slightly surprising, disconcerting um, and I'm sure for some people as well a bit of kind of like what the fuck is, is this? There was um, plenty of artists who felt like that when they first arrived. <laughs> Am I really playing this weird little horrible room? Yeah. Um, but by the end of the night, people usually fell in love with it. Yeah. Mm. It was the walk down Baxdell Street mm -hmm. um, that put people off at first because there'd be this sort of running stream of stuff from the restaurants. The occasional rat, mm -hmm. and then you say, "Oh, it's up here," and oh, you just you go, "Oh sad. my god!" Yeah, mm -hmm. it was uh, yeah. But everybody that I ever put on there, um, just about everybody I've ever been who's ever been in there has gone, "Wow, this place is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely astonishing. It has this fantastic sound, mm -hmm. thick walls." It's resonant floor. I mean, what more do you need? Just not the smell of rat urine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember one musician coming in, and he's, he's a lad from Manchester, so we spoke the same language. And um, he said, Ammonia, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah. Is it fucking rats? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That was uh, Lee Patterson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> who came up with that one, yeah. <laughs> Fucking them all, yeah. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, you had to, you had to have the sort of sonne lumiere and smell <clears throat> um, to really appreciate it. But yes, it's an exquisitely strange building. Mm. We, found, we found that um, Connie came to pretty much every gig that we put on as well. She made a point of doing nearly every gig, and uh, she especially loved the noise gigs. She was uh, pretty taken with that guy, uh, Prurient, with his um, shirt off and his leather gloves on. She, she took quite a liking to him and loved his music. She was a music house. Hey? 
You sure it was the music? Yeah, because her hair was a mess afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to do with shirt off and leather gloves and stuff. I think they had something to do with it as well, but uh, yeah, 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 she loved the noise gigs. So I, I think it's, it's been closed or it's been unused since maybe 2016. Um, what do you think, I mean, is there a future for it rather like, it's kind of like a sealed vault in a way, like there's still posters on the walls and things. And um, I don't know, I just wonder like, it's, is it's time done or is there some way that it can be kind of resurrected Again, it's not really the most accessible uh, possible venue. Um, but I, I just wonder if, you know, do you just sort of close the door on it and move on and, you know, apply? I think it's probably got, it's potentially, if, um, you know, all the sort of like organizational logistics and permissions and um, persuading people, the right people um, to, uh, open it up again and, and, and put gigs on there. It's potentially got more of a future as a venue than many venues probably have at the moment um, because it's not so reliant on um, sort of regular uh, box office revenue that uh, 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 most venues are um, or bar sales or whatever, mm. you know, the economics around it are as shonky as the place is, really. Mm. So that makes it um, potentially far more resilient in, in terms of the devastation that's hitting the, uh, the live music business at the moment. And I suspect that um, with uh, venues likely to continue closing over the next year or so, that's going to shake things out a bit. And um, the smaller and um, more flexible types of venues, uh, of which Modern Tower is probably at an extreme end, are, are going to be the ones that survive uh, the, the, the present sort of difficulties uh, better than many will. And, you know, it'll all come back, but in, in it'll be remake, remodel in many ways. And, um, you know, I think, you know, potentially Modern Tower is in... in if someone can get it together in a, in a in a very good position to be in the vanguard in Newcastle at least anyway of of uh, um, making live music happen in a unique and interesting way in a unique and interesting place mm. without being dependent on uh, uh, so much on on being able to turn a thousand quid out of the night you know or whatever. I think I think one one of the issues, and it was something that Connie was like constantly defending against, and I think a lot has to be said about kind of Connie's like values and vision around, it, which is what kept the cap the tower going, and like a lot of the arts scene around the tower for all of the struggle that it was at the time. I think one of the main things is that you know Connie was always defending against the kind of great white sort of academic patriarchs who wanted to take over the tower because of its history. Um, you know the poetry history Ginsburg etc mm. and you know she, she's always spending that off and I know and I know that's something that's very you know it's always on the table I know that I'll not name who I, but I know the people in the universities who are wanting to get there they would love to have that as like some historic kind of landmark that's associated with a particular kind of um, academic institution um, or, or academic institutions uh, but particularly position it in the poetry it, within poetry and I think Connie always talked about, she didn't see it. She saw it as, as a space for independent art. She didn't necessarily assign it just to be a, like a poetry tower or just to be like a gig venue. For her, it was a really creative space and it was a really, it was a, a place where things were, were kind of created and sustained. And a lot of those values and that vision and that, 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 that she saw as being like independence around that 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 creative um, kind of like spirit and that cr creative way of bringing things together that was outside of kind of like capitalist constructs. So I think it's a really difficult one. I I, I agree it could be so many things, um, but 
will it ever hold the same kind of prescience if it's if it's taken over in any kind of commercial context of course it won't will it could it just be like a historic site it will lose a lot of stuff and then it depends who's going to take ownership of it and i think again going back to that sort of vision of connie's and also the way it worked the reason it was magical was because it was this collective space nobody owned it Mm. nobody had like mm. a, a sore grip on it yes connie would be kind of like grouchy and be like no i don't want this or i want this but in a way she was just keeping alive that independence around it so it couldn't be owned and capitalized upon so i think it's a re i think it's a really really difficult one i think there will be people queuing up want to take it over because it has such kind of historic uh interest to people who want to present a certain vision of the arts, particularly in the 60s and 70s in, the, in, in, in Newcastle. I think the, think the good, thing good thing is that it doesn't actually just belongs to the council in the sense that they have to look after it. Um, and that's the reason it survived. They never, changed the, the the lease it was 26 pounds a year in 1964 and it was 26 pounds a year whenever the last rent was paid um and 50p a week you can't beat that um and one of the things that Connie did was to keep the archaeologists and the um, english heritage people at three arms lengths um, because they could really get in and mess things up. Um, the problems need, you know, need to be handled, but nobody can take it over because it is an, an ancient monument. It's beyond grade, grade one, double star, listed, whatever. It's, you can't do anything with it. You cannot... It's like you can you can't repaint Stonehenge. Well, you could, but you know. What I mean. So that's what I would. So there couldn't be. Good is, thing. is there another venue like it? Is there another venue like it in uh, the country? Well, I like, agree. With, I've never come across good. anywhere. Um, you know, when I've been doing tours in Europe, and you get this. Oh, this is a really special place, and it's it's basically it's a squat. You know, <laughs> it's a squat. <laughs> With, with bent chairs and you know what the deal is and fine, but it's not special. But the tower is special and anybody who goes there and performs or goes there as audience goes bloody hell. Um, could it ever be reanimated? <sighs> not without a lot of money and I don't, I don't see that it, that it could, and if it got kind of absorbed into, I don't know, academy or whatever, Christ, <laughs> that's impossible. Um, so I think, you know, maybe it, it, it will just be um, a time capsule, then, and in 50 years' time, somebody will break it open and go, bloody hell, let's do this. I mean, it, Yeah, I agree. It would take a lot of money to make it usable again because if you if you left it for a few weeks or a month, um, it would smell. You'd have to clean it up, and people would climb over the wall, and it left a mess on the stairs, and you know. Um, and I just dread to think what it would be like now after it's, no one's been yeah. here for such a long time. When I was involved, um, the the lead off the roof was nicked. And we found out on Thunder Thursday when it just gushed through the building. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a, a frequent uh, fun place for people to hide out. I think on the roof. Yeah. Mm. Not to mention the lower tower, which is Rat Central. Yeah. Mm. So we're having a whip round then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, being serious, aren't we? Here? I mean, I did. I, con I contacted the council. Um, I think it was last year to sort of find out what was what was going on, if anything was going on. And the email I got back was just, um, "There's no plans, and 
uh, it's not in a rentable state. Um, but what are your proposals? So it appears that the council are, you know, open to something, but I guess that something has to come along with a lot of capital um, to make it habitable, I guess. Yeah, not a huge amount, but you know, considering that. Mm. The one per the person we've talked about, but we don't know. Where is Connie? Mm. I'd love to know. And she still, I believe she still lives <laughs> not Grand far God. from me, but she's not, ans yeah, yeah. I think, but that's so mystical Connie. Yeah. It's so like Connie to not be at the center of this conversation, which is where she should be really. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a brilliant film to be made of Connie talking about the history of the tower. Did she to ever tell anybody else the story about being invited to lunch by William Burroughs? No, but no. she did tell me that she saw the Velvet Underground playing in the factory in New York. That wouldn't surprise me. No, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, she did tell me that she babysat for Yoko Ono once. Yoko Ono, yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was unimpressed with Yoko Ono, as I recall. <laughs> Pretty much so. <laughs> I'm on the verge of phoning social services, I think. <laughs> God. Uh, yeah. Come on, tell us a story about William Burroughs because I, well, I don't. Burroughs know apparently story. came to Newcastle um, because Ginsburg had told him, oh, it's a good place, you should go up there. And he invited Connie and a few other people to lunch at the Station Hotel. So this was fully clothed lunch with William Burroughs. I mean, what more do you need? It's a great story. <laughs> you know, just imagine her enjoying it. And Burroughs croaking away and smoking. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Adam, you really should have sent an invitation to Connie. Well, did. I did. I, I wrote to um, her, um, but there was no reply. I tried to email her, but... Um, Oh yeah, the email bounced back, and but yeah, I, d I did write a letter. She was invited, but it's been seven years since I've been yeah. Me too. It's been a long time. Yeah, but I, I think I think I get I think something that's quite interesting is you know Connie was like an artist in her own right, and really like the tower was her work of art over all of these years. You know she was. She was a poet and she she ended up, you know, supporting the backbone of of like a very, I guess, male dominated, not I guess it was like male dominated, like poets art scene. And she was often the one behind it, organizing, you know, doing all the work. And um, for her, she translated her kind of creativity and her love, her love and her support of, of the arts by supporting the tower. And for her, this, I remember her talking about when we were putting gigs on from early 2000s onwards, how this was like for her really important because it was like another generation, yeah. you know, coming along and perpetuating this, this spirit of independent creativity. Um, so I think that, I think it, it, in a way that's why the tower can never really be the same as it was as well, because a lot of it was to do with the fact that it was a labor of love for, for yeah. Connie and all that she, that she provided. Although I think many of us have a brilliant story. What was so amazing about Connie is, is she was um, absolutely anti-reverence. Like Connie was deliberately as difficult as she could be. And um, we all loved her for it. And she'd make things incredibly awkward. You yeah. know, I mean, I know I wasn't a key. Well, I'd, I, you know, sometimes I'd help out with the keys, but I was not like a key holder, like you know, <laughs> some, yeah. of, some of these fellows. And um, I think there'd be incidents trying to get the key. Where was the key? Yeah. Connie didn't want to give the key. We'd have yeah. to beg her, Connie, we've got a gig on this week. Please, can we have access to the tower? And I, you can I get it like- I where I left it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, she'd turn up, she'd be like, sometimes you'd be like, oh, really hope Connie likes this gig. And she'd really surprise you and love it. But then on other occasions, she'd just be like, I hate you, I hate the gig. <laughs> <laughs> I hate everybody, <laughs> but um, but I always felt it was done in a way to keep us all on our toes, 
and she really is a true anarchist like she really is a true anarchist in her in her politics and the thing is she came from like a working class mining village she had a very very poor upbringing and she was absolutely kind of self-made self-educated she didn't have the privileges that many of the people who were on the poetry scene had and she was very aware of it and in a way that carved a kind of a like it, it galvanized and carved a kind of like spirit and way of being in terms of how hardcore the tower was because you couldn't go to the tower and expect a, a cushy ride you had to kind of work for it it was freezing cold or mm. boiling hot and if if anybody i mean usually because it was such a small space i had this big kind of like medieval door so there was no no quiet entrances into the tower everybody was announced and sometimes everybody would look and you would know whether you were a popular person to be entering the tower at that time or whether you should probably just turn around and and leave at that point you know but um yeah yeah, yeah. i know what you mean because uh, that's what i meant earlier when um, i was told when i first got in touch with her i was i was interviewed to see if i was worthy of yeah. getting gigs on and i had to there was a few the words i said that seemed to uh, get me to pass the test yeah, because actually, you've just reminded me, it was not easy, was it? And mm -hmm. actually, um, she really trusted Jad's finger because of you, and she trusted you, has because of your ethos and everything that was behind the way that you, that, the way you worked. She wasn't, she was very, very picky about who she allowed to put stuff on yeah, in the town. Yeah, yeah. The, downside, was, the downside was, though, I had to uh, look after lots of gigs that I didn't like. <laughs> yeah. If you want to put your gigs on, you'll have to see everybody else's as well. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that, that was the horrible bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Full-time job. Yeah, yeah. And at the time I was uh, doing the radio promo job and that was 10 hours a day as well. And I was doing <laughs> Jazz Finger. And uh, it burnt me out in the end. I thought I'd packed in gigs and live music for uh, for good and then I got sucked in the tusk. Yeah. <laughs> There's no escape. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no escape. Oh, 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 oh. It's all gone quiet. It's gone quiet. Um, well, I don't really have any other questions. Right. Do you have any questions <laughs> for, for each other? Paul, would you uh, like to tell us about the uh, Morden Tower benefit gig you did at the bridge? Oh, my God because that was an absolutely insane evening it was uh, ben Ponton didn't actually perform that night because we fucked up the timings but we raised over a thousand quid um which is wonderful mm -hmm. and it was hot sweaty confused and it all went sideways when Jamie Rest decided to insult the bar, the pub manager, mm -hmm. right at the end. So it, it it really did. It was a fantastic time. I got punched in the face. Um, did you? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you had a fight, didn't you? Well, I, I didn't have a fight. Somebody just hit. Somebody me. had a fight with you. <laughs> yeah, somebody had a fight with me because his wife kept on rushing in without paying, and we said, "Hang on, you're out." <laughs> you go in um and then she wanted to speak to somebody so we said okay you can speak to that someone and then out and then he belted me one at which point james, you did the, this you bloke did. belted right. me in the face cut me is it because he didn't want to pay to get in or something like that um it was because he was an arsehole i think is the technical term <laughs> you know? it's um yeah, he's an arsehole. And he was part of the, the paratry thing. That was the other thing that was annoying. Mm -hmm. um, he, so at that point, Jamie Rest and um, Mike, you know, Big Mike, they escorted them off the premises. It was, it was well worth seeing. Yeah, it was a good night. <laughs> <laughs> There was loads of people performing, wasn't there? Wasn't there about there was, 30 or 40 acts or something? Like I that? think there were about 25 to 30. Right, right, right. Um, plus, of course, uh, Soviet France, Rodri Davis and Tom Pickard, who didn't <laughs> actually get on to play or perform or read. So, you know, I was really pissed off with myself for that. 
That was eight years ago, for God's sake, you know? Wow. But it's, um, yeah, it, it was good. It, was, it would have been a good night, and it, it probably needed doing fairly regularly to keep the place going. Mm -hmm. um, and just before I parted company, didn't leave, I just parted company, um, we'd actually made some plans to put in heating mm -hmm. to actually reduce the level of cold and damp. But that didn't happen. <laughs> Oh, God, the cold and the damp. So, so I'll ask one question. What was your favourite gig? My favourite gig? I've got a list here. <laughs> I've got... So I've got a list as well. Yeah. Have you? Excellent. We're, we're, we're list guys, aren't we, Hass? You know, it's the facial hair that does it. Yeah. Um, Prank Sturgeon, IDM Theftable and Ludo Mich, which I think was absolutely the best gig we ever, that I've ever seen there. There was the Soviet France outfit twice, very good. Taco Bells and Stuart Arnott, which was really good. Rodri Davis and Mazen Kabaj and a couple of other guys from Lebanon. And Common Objects with Rodri, John Butcher and Lee Patterson. Kenneth Goldsmith reading The Weather Diary of Thomas Applewhite which was an 18th century weather diary, which he read in the style of William Blake for three hours without a break. Now that, that's what I call, yes, absolutely. That was the AV Festival that did that one. Yeah. Um, the, the No Audience Underground was something else that I think with, that Morden Tower personifies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody was a performer. Everybody was active in some way other than just absorbing mm -hmm. what was being put on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was my list. Okay, Haas, go away. Well, I think my, my topmost gig was uh, the very first Sir Richard Bishop gig. Yeah. yeah. People were yeah. so excited about having the Sun City girl go over. Um, and you could feel the excitement when he went down the storm, and it was just outrageously good. Mm. Um, first acoustic Soviet France, yep. gig there. I love that. Freezing cold. I, I, I know I never hear it, but my memories are. <laughs> uh, who else have I got here? Um, that Bybrook Cathedral Orchestra gig, the first one I ever did at the Tower. That was amazing, particularly because they were quite transcendent. And uh, shafts of sunlight came through the side windows to shine. Oh. And that was a moment in a half, I can yeah. tell you. Volcano the Bear. Um, oh, yeah. Jack Rose played a few. Yeah, yeah. Jack and Rose was excellent. Yeah. And that was really special, I thought. And uh, yeah, the yeah. times Chris Cusano played as well. Um, yeah. I think people like them worked really, really well in the tower. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 And um, of the Jump and Hog. Club gigs. Uh, I must mention a gig by a fellow called Jackie Levin. Uh, oh, he played there, and that was just one of the best nights I've had in the tower as well. Um, really funny songs and amazing banter for, between the songs as well. Um, and yeah, yeah, that, I, I wasn't expecting that to be a good night at all, but it, it turned out to be one of my faves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jack, Jack Rose was a probably won the highlight the late Jack Rose that was that was an amazing amazing gig and he was just at his height of playing I think everything he released kind of after that was it 10 it was called but mm -hmm. it was um it was absolutely incredible um yeah. I thought um I really uh, loved to put Bridget Hayden on there yeah. um Sarah Sullivan Ian Gaze um yeah. uh supported and Culver did that was that was amazing um oh do you remember an acoustic Culver gig with them um, uh, squeeze boxes. Mm. Oh, that ring a bell. Times, yeah. Jazz yeah. Finger, you played some blinders there as well. There were some really good gigs earlier on that Jazz Finger did as well. Um, and I did enjoy, even though they were very, they were a bit more pop and stuff. But Hawk and Hacksaw, there was like a mm. period of gigs of like Hawk and Hacksaw, uh, uh, Daniel Padden. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was some really nice stuff. Volcano, mm -hmm. um, the Bay said as well, and. There was like a, re a real spate of, um, they were very, again, these were kind of artists that were just on the brink of being, of doing bigger things. Yeah. And um, there was 
uh, and um, Nala played there as well. I don't really remember Nala. Yeah. So yeah, um, I think as well it was it, it did become a space. I mean, ev even going back to kind of like the two thousands, where a lot more women performers were on in the tower compared to other venues, yeah. and a lot more marginalised performers were on in the That's tower. A lot more performers of colour started to come on in the tower, which was really important. And like you compare that to other venues, it was there was it was doing a lot of breakthrough stuff. You know, like in terms of actually really starting to think about um, not just diversity difference, but but art, art difference in terms of artistry. You know, like it was such a diverse diverse palette wasn't it it wasn't like it was all noise it wasn't mm -hmm. all acoustic mm -hmm. it was very much about uh, people who were at the forefront of, of you know creating new new work that often would not be able to be performed anywhere else as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah sweet well i think that's maybe a good note to to leave it on thank you very much for joining and sharing uh, your memories and yeah it's been really um, great to listen I do like your your brick wall it's, you look really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna yeah it's very psychedelic you're gonna freak Ooh. out when you watch this video back <laughs> <laughs> yeah out the wall. yeah it's sort of 70s top of the pop video <laughs> yeah great very appropriate yeah <laughs> also your teeth keep disappearing that's it <laughs> uh, it's weird yeah. grills <laughs> mm. right are we, are we nice seeing you all folks okay. a pleasure Bye, everyone nice to see you yeah, thank you, you very much bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye.